So I'm going to ask the delegates to please, please take your seats. All right, so we are reconvening convention. And just for everyone to know, I've asked for some special recognition today. It's another first for an MGU convention. We have some very, very special folks that actually put this whole event together for us. They actually are the ones that work in helping us to ensure that we are safe, that our rights are protected, that our employers treat us with dignity and respect. They are the folks that keep us going. The staff of the MGEU. When they say it takes a village, we've got a city. So folks, if we are the heartbeat, this is our bloodline. <laughs> These are the folks that we can't afford to live without. They are the ones that protect us, make sure that we're safe. They have our back day in and day out. And let me tell you, the biggest, biggest thing for me walking into that office the first time working with them. It astounded me the amount of emotion, energy, and how much pride they take in looking after us. So once again, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, each and every one of you, thank you. See, guys, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys deserve this. I know. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, come up here. Yes, we have a point of, I mean, a sister on microphone three. Uh, yes, I'm aptly at the con mic, and I'd like to make a point of privilege, a point. I'd like to make a point. Um, so <laughs> uh, it, there's been some concern and some talk about the pins that have been left in our, in our bags um, with the, uh, though we, wel yeah, we welcome the sentiment, um, but it doesn't quite put forward a very professional spin to it. Now, those of you who know me know I am certainly not one to not use this word. But um, there's a time and a place, right? And the image that I know that many of us, not just me, would like to promote is an image of professionalism, is an image of welcoming uh, for young and old and everybody in between. Like I tell my students, everybody's welcome to my party. This doesn't say welcome. Okay. 
Sister, I hear you loud and clear, and I will say I thank you so much for coming to the mic, and I thank each and every delegate that has come to me sharing the same sentiment, that they, they weren't thrilled with it. If folks don't want it, leave it on the table. We'll look after it. Um, please know that in no way was it meant to be um, disrespectful to anyone. Um, it was, it's, you know, through our national union, it's a way that we're trying to connect up with millennials and trying to figure out what's the best way to make sure that they're aware that we're around, that the union is relevant for them and that we're part of it. But I definitely respect and appreciate you coming to the mic. And like I say, for those that aren't, you know, in, aren't favorable for the button, leave it on the table and we'll look after them. So please know, though, that there was no offense meant for anyone. Thank you for that, Marissa. Thank you. I have also been told that some folks, when they scanned in for their t-shirts, thought they were scanning in uh, for registration for this afternoon. If you did not actually go to the registration desk to get scanned in, which reminds me I didn't, could you please go and get scanned at some point today? Thank you so much, and I believe Doug. Oh, you? Okay. Oh. I am going to turn the chair over to Janet at this point. Thank you. Well, that was really exciting. Thank you so much, everybody, for acknowledging our staff. Um, a quick reminder, for those that want to submit questions for the delegates for the candidate forum this afternoon, your questions have to be in the box at the registration desk by 3 o'clock. And now, drum roll, um, I'm going to call for nominations for our provincial officers. Um, when we do our elections, as I said to you yesterday, we will first elect tomorrow our president, then our vice president, second, third, and then fourth. So today I'm gonna to call for nominations for each position independently. Once the nomination's been received, I will then in reverse order ask the candidate if they are going to accept the nomination and then we'll move to the next position, okay? So I will now open the floor for nominations for the position of president. Speaker at mic four. Leanne Oakley, 415 uh, EMS. I would like to proudly nominate my mentor, my friend, Wayne Shacken, for President MGU. Thank you, Leanne. <laughs> Speaker at mic four. Terry Rear, Local 86, Board. I am honored and privileged to put the name of Michelle Goronsky forward for president of MGU. Thank you, Terry. In reverse order, Michelle, will you accept the nomination? Michelle, uh, with great thanks to my nominator and appreciation of the room, I absolutely will. Thank you so much. You. Wayne, do you accept the nomination? With thanks to my nominator, I do. <laughs> Calling for the second time for nominations for president. Calling for the third and final time, seeing no speakers at the mic, I, oh, I did this backwards. Um, I'll close nominations, <laughs> pardon me. Wayne, you've accepted, Michelle, you've accepted, sorry folks. Um, okay, we're now gonna deal with nominations for the first vice president. Speaker at one. Uh, Carol Reimer, Local 69 and I have the privilege of nominating Charlotte McWilliams. Speaker at mic one. Uh, Brad Barr, Local 62. I would like to nominate JP LaPointe, please. Speaker at mic one. Peter Yurchenko, Local 13, Area 5. I'd like to take this opportunity to nominate Derek Pierce, our vice, first vice president. Thank you. 
calling for the second time for nominations for first vice president. Hi there, I'm Mark Chornley. I'm uh, from Mint Park Services, Local 434. I'd like to nominate Christina Kwan. Um, nomination paper, just a moment please. Sorry for the delay, folks. Pardon me. Were nomination papers submitted for Oh, the... that I don't know. It's my first kind of time oh, here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. My apologies. Nomination papers for candidates had to be in by noon today. Okay. Sorry okay. about that. No, thank you. No, thank you for... Uh, okay. So uh, now calling for the third and final time for nominations for first vice president. Seeing no other speakers at the mic, in reverse order. Derek, will you accept the nomination? Derek Pierce, Local 13, Area 5. Yes, I accept my nominations. Thank you. Thank you. JP, will you accept the nomination? Thank you, sister. With great thanks to my brother Brad, who's somewhat mic shy, I will accept. Thank you, Thank you JP. Charlotte, will you accept the nomination? With thanks to my nominator, I accept. We will now move to nominations for your second vice president. I'll open the floor for nominations. Hi, Jody Gillis, Local 73. It's my privilege to nominate Brother Doug Troke for re-election to the position of second vice president. Calling for the second time for nominations for second vice president. Calling for the third and final time and seeing no speakers at the mic. Doug, do you accept the nomination? <laughs> uh, with thanks to my uh, brother, I do accept the nomination. Having no other uh, candidates, Doug, I declare you elected as our second vice president. <laughs> Speaker at the mic. I'm humbled by the, uh, the support from the uh, delegates and the convention, and I uh, will work hard for the next uh, term, and uh, I'm just speechless. Thank you. Okay, with that, I will now open the floor to nominations for the position of third vice president. Oh, pardon me, speaker at mic two. Amanda Russell, Social Sciences, Local 46. It's once again my great honour to nominate Shelley Wiggins for third vice president. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Speaker at Mike One. Kimberly Lynn, Local 71, post-secondary component. It is with great honour that I nominate Sister Shannon Reynolds to the position of third. Thank you, Kim. Calling for the second time for nominations for third vice president. Calling for the third and final time, seeing no speakers at the mic, in reverse order. Shannon, will you accept the nomination? I'm over here. With thanks to my nominator? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Shelley, will you accept the nomination? With thanks to my nominator, I also accept. Thank you. 
I'll now open the floor for nominations for fourth vice president. Speaker at mic one. <clears throat> Deb Jamerson, local 26 legal. Uh, gives me great pleasure to put forward the name of Ed Miller. Thank you, Deb. Speaker at mic four. Chris Monchab. I'd like to nominate uh, Joe Dooley for our fourth vice president. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'm just going to go over to the other side. A speaker at mic three. Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wilhelmina Gaburno. I'm in. Uh, can you, can you pull the mic down just a wee little bit, ma'am? Sorry. Hello, my name is Wilhelmina Gaburno. I'm in local 113. I respectfully nominate William White for fourth vice president. Thank you very much, ma'am. Speaker at mic four. I'm Barb Stambuski, local 360, and it's my honor to nominate Penny Wainwright for fourth. Thank you, Jen. In reverse order, Penny, will you let your name stand? Absolutely, with thanks to my nominator, humbly. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Um, for Will White, I have a letter from him indicating his acceptance and thanks to his nominator. Joe, do you accept the nomination? Yes, of course, and thanks to my nominator. Ed, do you accept the nomination? With great thanks, yes, thank you. That concludes our nominations, and I will turn the chair over to our second vice president. That'd be you, Doug. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon. Alex Himmelfarb is, is his, in his distinguished federal public service career, Alex was the executive director of the National Parole Board, secretary treasurer, secretary of the Treasury Board, and appointed clerk of the Privy Council, the most senior civil servant in the Canadian government, where he served three prime ministers until he was made ambassador of Canada to the Italian Republic. Since his time in government, he's been outspoken critic of neoliberalism and an advocate of properly funded public services through taxation. He's written a slew of books, most recently, Tax is Not a Four-Letter Word. Dr. Himmelfarb is also a director with Canadian, Canadians for Tax Fairness and Director Emeritus of the Glendon School of Public and International Affairs at York University. Let's give a warm welcome to Alex Himmelfarb. Thank you. I, I sound so impressive. What are you laughing at? <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. I'm, thanks for the invitation. This is the kind of room I love to be in, a room that understands the value, the importance of service and of solidarity, who understands profoundly that we're stronger together, that public service is a vocation, and that a strong public service is a competitive advantage for Canada. Notwithstanding all of that, the ideas of public service and solidarity have sure taken a beating over the last few decades. Um, I spent almost 30 years as a public servant, and I can tell you even over the course of my time, it got harder and harder to be a public servant and less and less fun. You could make a strong case that the, the paradox of our age, the paradox of our time, is that our collective action problems, 
have never been more challenging. But our collective toolkit has never been so under attack. That's a paradox and irony that's going to do us real harm if we don't turn the corner. So what do I mean by collective action problems? Those are the problems we could only hope to achieve together. The problems for which there are no individual solutions. We can only solve them as a community, as a province, as a country, as a global community. And you know what those problems are. Nature loss and climate change threaten every aspect of our lives. They present a, an existential challenge. And yet, we miss every target. Our, our actions are timid in the face of what is an existential threat. Growing income and wealth inequality fragments us, divides us, undermines our democracy, turns us one against the other. In fact, extreme inequality, which continues to grow, undermines our economy. You can't run an economy when people can't buy goods and services. More and more Canadian families live with insecurity, economic insecurity. Can't live, can't imagine living two or three weeks if they lost their job. Go from paycheck to paycheck. Worry about putting meat on the table. And yet, we have undermined the tools we need to address these problems. For the first time, for the first time in living memory, we expect that our kids won't have it as good as we did. And we take that for granted. So somehow or other, our kids won't have it as good as we did. That's not good enough. Is that good enough? Is that inevitable? Do we have to do that? Isn't it our job to leave the planet in better shape than we got it? Instead, we're leaving our kids with a world of woes? We can do better than this, but we can't do better than this by attacking the collective toolkit. And what is this collective toolkit? Public service. That's our major tool. There are two tools that we use to solve collective problems, government and unions. And what are the two things that have been under attack for 40 years? Government and unions. Four decades of some version of austerity has meant cuts to vital services, have meant that public servants are constantly asked first to do more with less, then to do less with less, and then to do less with less as they're paid less. It grinds you down. And what happens with, after four decades is people start losing trust in their public institutions. Trust in governments at an all-time low. Trust in public institutions generally is at an all-time low. Trust in all institutions, including the private sector, is at an all-time low. We don't even trust one another. By the way, I can, I can be fully trusted, but <laughs> we, are, we are turning to, against each other. We are making life a zero-sum game. We are thinking that the only basis for organizing society is competition. One of, uh, let me just do a square bracket. There, there's a, a particularly frightening and disturbing set of studies by two political scientists by the name of Foa and Monk. And they have been tracking commitment to democracy because there was, for a long time, we all assumed there's an inevitable march to democracy. Everybody's moving to some kind of liberal democracy. It's inevitable. Human rights, democratic process, it's unstoppable. And that was the assumption of Foe and Amok, and they were, they, they were tracking what's people's commitment, how, how committed are people. What have they found over the last 10 years? They have found a stark 
decline in people's commitment to democracy. Where? In countries like Canada and the US and the UK and France. A sharp decline led by young people. And so why have they lost commitment to democracy? Because government has backed away from their lives. They have seen tuitions go up. They've seen welfare payments stuck. Fewer and fewer unemployed people covered by unemployment insurance. Healthcare taking longer and longer. Pharma being unaffordable. Daycare being unavailable. And they're, and they're saying there's got to be a different way, a better way. That's a very scary thing because we don't need less democracy. What we need is more democracy. Democracy in the home, democracy in the workplace, democracy in government. I, I do love the sound of here, here, so, <laughs> so you'll forgive me if I pause and just bask for a moment. The, so I want to talk a little bit, so the, you know, in case there was any joy, because I saw the enthusiasm with which you gre greeted the staff and, and the new nominees and your new executive, so, uh, and my mission in life is to stomp out joy wherever I find it. <laughs> so, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about how we got here, because if we don't understand how we got here, we're not going to be able to pull ourselves out. So how did we get here? And I'm going to start, how many of you have ever heard of Antonio Gramsci? I'm not surprised. He's, he's, he, first of all, he wrote in the 30s. He died in the mid-30s. And he was an old, and I have a, a kind of a, a thing for old, because he was an old, communist, and I have kind of thing for, no, he, had, he was an old communist who did almost all of his writing in, in, in prison. Um, and almost everything that's worth reading was written in prison. In any case, he was writing while, while around him, he was witnessing the rise of fascism. Things were going crazy. The world was upside down. Horrible things were happening in Italy, in Germany, and everywhere. The world he, he saw was upside down. And as he was writing and as he was trying to think, and by the way, I don't know how many of you feel the world is upside down these days when you watch cable news or you see who's getting elected. I'm not partisan, but you see, I, truly, I hate all parties, but you see, you see who's getting elected in Ontario and you see who's getting elected in Quebec and you see, don't you sometimes say the world's upside down? And don't you sometimes think, if I don't turn off the TV, I'm never going to get to sleep because I'm so anxious? You're, we're suffering from political anxiety syndrome. You know, this. Well, he, he felt that, and he was trying to understand it. And I think we, we have a, a similar kind of thing going on. He coined the phrase interregnum. Interregnum, interregnum is actually uh, the term that was used when, when emperors and Roman emperors replaced each other and then there's an in-between time between emperors where there's a lot of confusion. Well, he felt, felt that societies got into these places that were in-between times where we don't trust the past, we don't like the past because it feels like it failed us. But we have no vision of the future because there's no, there's no idea of how to get out of where we are. That's the kind of in-between time. In, in Gramsci's own words, he described it as the old world is dying, the new world is not yet born. And he described that as a time of monsters and morbid symptoms. And there is no shortage of monsters and morbid symptoms. In fact, we often vote for them. So. <laughs> so what, what, what was the world like that he was capturing? This is a time of resentment, because we're angry at the past, and we're angry at what isn't there and the broken promises. It's also a time of fear, because we don't know what the future holds. And in that period of resentment and fear, it's so easy for us to turn on each other, to, to rush to our tribal association to get comfort and to fight with the tribe next door. So we're ripe for tribalism and xenophobia. We're also ripe, we're also ripe for magical solutions. For, for the strong man, and it's usually a man, for the strong man who promises, 
well, I'll fix everything. I'll, I'll, I'll bring the old elites to heal. I'll bring government to heal. I will drain the swamp. I will end the gravy train. Don't worry about a thing. It's me and I can do it. And, 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 and he warned that we are vulnerable in these in-between times to these demagogues that promise, promise us magical hats that if we put it on, everything will be okay because they're in control. Because the, and you know what they also promise? They promise that they will defend us. They will defend us against people who are not like us. They'll defend your interests in a zero-sum game against foreigners and different people maybe gay people or immigrants or people of different color. It's a very dangerous time, and we are seeing that. We're seeing it in Hungary, in Poland. We're seeing it rising in Western Europe. We're seeing it to the south. And don't for a minute think Canada is immune. Have I cheered you up yet? God, I feel suicidal. And I'm <laughs> And, and I already knew what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. <laughs> any, any question? No. Um, but the, of course there's a better way, there's a way out, and we'll talk about that briefly. <laughs> but what we need is a new paradigm, a new narrative, a new story. What we need is a new common sense. We need a different way of thinking about the world, of thinking about each other, of thinking about government and our relationship to it. And the trouble is we're blocked from developing this new common sense because old ideas die hard. And they die hard for a variety of reasons. They die hard because people of power double down in these times of change to protect their power. Change is hard. But also people with even a bit of privilege double down to protect whatever little privilege they have because change is scary. And so old ideas live on like vampires until we can find the stake to drive in their heart. And we have to expose those old ideas and unblock before we can build a new paradigm. And so I want to talk a little bit about what those old, old ideas are. And I can, I can, oh, I got lots of time. So I can depress you for about seven more minutes and then we'll turn the corner and I'll depress you some more. The, and one of, the, one of the ways I can get at what this, this old common sense, these old, these old ways of thinking are is by three studies, all of which, and this, I'm just picking them at random because they all happened within the last two weeks. And so they really are just like fresh off the boat. The first one I'm going to mention, and, and, and uh, all of them are outside of this country. So the first one I'll mention is the report from the American Treasury on the U.S. deficit and debt. It came out on Monday. Did any of you see that? And what it said was Amer the deficit is soaring. It's soaring. And it's going to continue to spike. It's going to reach pretty close to a trillion in just a couple of years. A trillion's a lot of money, by the way. And it can be entirely attributed to the recent tax cuts. Now, the Republicans in the state said that they were going to cut taxes and it was going to have no impact on services and entitlements because tax cuts would so grow the economy that they'd pay for themselves. And if anything had to be cut, it would just be waste. Just, you know, nothing, nothing that you care about. There, don't worry about it. Tax cuts are free. By the way, that has never happened. Tax cuts have never paid for themselves. Not in history, not in this planet, not in this universe, not on any known planet, and it's not going to happen in the future. Tax cuts are not free. And so what happens within, within just weeks and months of the tax cuts? Now the Republicans are saying, oh God, the deficit's so high, we're going to have to cut public services and entitlements. Because the purpose of tax cuts is entirely that 
The purpose of tax cuts is to reduce government's footprint, is to make government. And so every time you vote for a tax cut, a few dollars in your pocket, you are voting for less collective toolkit, a weakened government, a weakened public service. That report, that tax cuts increase the deficit and then the deficit creates pressure to cut government, we have watched that play out in Canada, the US and the UK for 40 years. But somehow this notion that tax cuts are a free good is so seductive, we keep voting for it. I wouldn't vote. Well, I was going to say I wouldn't vote in a minute for a politician that promises a tax cut, but then I'd be out of vote. I, who doesn't promise tax cuts? It's so seductive. Tax cut, when, a, when a politician offers you a tax, tax cut, you ask him, what are you going to cut to pay for it? Because I know it's not free. Here, here. Did you say here, here? I love you. <laughs> Good luck in the election. <laughs> I know, I know I'm, I'm nonpartisan. I mean, <laughs> um, the second report is an IMF report. You know who the IMF is. They're one of the architects of neoliberalism, right? The International Monetary Fund. And they did a, a very boring and technical report and a long report. I haven't even finished reading it yet. It's very technical. Just came out uh, last week, uh, Monday. And it, it looks at public finances and compares over 30 countries on public finances. And it, it adds up all of the assets, the things government owns and government does, and all of the liabilities, debt, pension overhang, and so on because it, 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 it has found powerfully that the stronger the public finance balance is, the stronger the country is, the more resilient, the more able it is to handle problems, meet its challenges. Now, th this was hugely well covered in, in, in the British, um, in the Guardian in particular, in the British newspapers, because it highlighted the UK as one of the most fragile finance uh, economies. So it's, it, it's really well covered in this week's Guardian if you want to look at, at some of the elements of it. And it explains why the UK financed. The UK was the worst of all the countries it, says, it looked at save one. And, the, and what's most interesting, and this wasn't because of Brexit, this is all pre-Brexit. It's interesting to look at the explanation and the explanation is threefold, it won't surprise you. The first was huge, unaffordable tax cuts. They did tax cuts on the basis of, of resource revenues that are fragile, and those revenues dried up at the tax cut state because tax cuts are enduring, and that's because every politician that comes in after is afraid of raising them back up, right? So number one was tax cuts. Number two was deregulation, and, and particularly financial deregulation. Because yes, it unleashed forces, and those forces melted down the economy in 2008. Because what, it, what the deregulation did is it permitted greed. It permitted selfishness without control. The deregulation said, we trust you to pursue profit in a reasonable way. And they pursued profit at the expense of everybody else. So that was the second one. But for me, the most interesting explanation, and the one they, they spent the most time on, was the privatization hoax. Now, they don't call it that. It's the IMF, after all. But if you read it, they're saying privatization, the stripping of public assets, selling off public goods, thinking that somehow the private sector would be better able to deliver water or rail or air or air control, traffic control, thinking that was an enormous hoax that cost us enormously. How's that a hoax? Number one, it ends up costing more because when you build profit in, the, <laughs> the price goes up. Number two, the quality of service goes down, and it goes down in a variety of ways. One of the ways it goes down is private service skim off 
tough customers. They deal with the easy customers because that's where the profit is. The people who cost the most, the patient that costs the most, the old person that needs the most help, they're not a, they're not a price leader. And so the quality of service goes down. And profoundly, profoundly, democratic accountability is out the window. Because who are these private sector firms accountable to? They're shareholders, not their citizens. Now, you think about this. This is the IMF, the architect of privatization, everywhere it went. The people who said, cut taxes, cut services, and they're looking at it, and they are saying, <laughs> with respect to your concern about the button, I'm not going to say it the way I had originally intended. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I've taken out 10 minutes of my speech, you know. <laughs> um, they're saying, what have, we, what have we built here? What in the world have we done? We have oversold this neoliberal paradigm. The, the, so that's the, the second report. This is all within the last two weeks. You know, we could, we could find, if I'd done three weeks, we'd have found 10 such reports, by the way. The third report is a report you've all heard, and that's the UN report on climate change, which said that we have 12 years to clean up our act. And even that's going to have huge costs because it's already hitting us. But we have 12 years before the worst, the droughts, the flooding, the lost communities, the new, pest, the new pests that no pesticide can control, the new uh, mobility with people run away from, from climate-infected places to safer places, the change on crops. All of that's going to hit if we don't fix things in 12 years. And as that report was out, the very week, because that's just a week and a half old, the very week we had the opposition in Ottawa and several premiers, and yours included, fighting against cl a national climate change plan. What are we, are we more afraid of carbon taxes than we are of climate change? How the heck did that happen? Oh no, we could all die from the carbon tax. <laughs> what is that? So, you know, and the politicians that have read that the, the public reluctance, for, they've read it right. You know, if you poll Canadians, all the polls show us that Canadians believe that climate change is a serious problem. They believe it's largely human made. They believe the carbon tax is a terrible idea, it's just a tax grab. And, and don't touch my bottom line, and don't hurt my income, and really don't ask me to do much and I will recycle. <laughs> What's wrong with us? Okay, so how did we get here? Somebody answer me, because <laughs> I haven't got a clue. No, how did we get here? We have had 40 years of a dominant paradigm. You could call it neoliberalism, some do. You could call it trickle-down economics, by the way, it's not wealth that trickles down. You could, you could call it politics of austerity. Whatever you call it, I don't care what you call it. It has infused our common sense. It has infused how we see ourselves, how we see each other. And there are three, excuse me, there are three dominant notions in this neoliberal paradigm that we have to tackle dead on. And these are the three dominant ideas that I believe have changed our world. And we're not going to change anything until we get rid of these ideas, explode them, show them for what they are, throw them out the window. And the first one is, there is no such thing as society. How many of you ever heard that quote? It's, a, it's actually a Margaret Thatcher quote. She said that. She said, there's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. It is, that is the call, that is the call for self-reliance as the highest value. Now that's got a real appeal, eh? Of course, take, I'm gonna take responsibility for my life. I'm no slacker. I'm gonna take responsibility for my family. Screw the rest. Oh no, heck with the rest. <laughs> I have, I'm old, I have no filters, right? <laughs> Just have to go along with me on this. But 
you know, think about think about what that means. What does it really mean? I mean, it's got an appeal. Of course, we should take responsibility for our lives and our families. That makes sense. But we also should take responsibility for one another and our planet and our community. So what is she saying? She's saying, number one, don't look to society for excuses for your failures. Don't look to society for explanations for your failures. It's all on you. The rich deserve their wealth, and the poor deserve their poverty. It all works out. That's the first message. Shame. The second message is don't look to government for a handout. You're on your own. Government's not there. You know what government's for? Government's to punish bad people. Don't be a bad person. Pull up your socks. If you were poor, look at yourself. What it does, you know, that, that, that model, what it, what it does is it, it pretends away differences in power. It pretends away that we, has, we start from different vantage points. We start with advantage or disadvantage. It pretends away that the best road to success is to find yourself rich parents. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you're looking for practical advice, that's what a hot how I would do it. <laughs> if I had to do it all over again. So this model, this model ignores all that. And it, it's, it, it offers a pretend freedom, a pretend freedom, a freedom to be hungry. What it really does, it's, it's, it undermines freedom. It undermines choice. Because there are some choices that, you know, people, the, the right wing often says, you know, child care should be a choice. I agree with that. And how can people choose if there isn't regulated, affordable child care available that we built? <laughs> if, we don't, if we don't have a collective sense, we can't make those individual choices. Only the wealthy can. That's not what we want. We don't want freedom for some and pain for the others. What this model of there's no such thing as society does is it, at its worst, it justifies greed and selfishness. And it creates a kind of trickle-down meanness. And we become less and less compassionate. You know, people on the right, people say, don't give too much welfare. Well, that, that, that's a moral hazard. It undermines the work ethic. But give rich people a, a, a tax cut because they don't need any incentive because why? I have never known anybody who would prefer welfare payments to dignity and work. Never. Never. I've known people who rip off corporate incentives and maybe there are a handful who rip off any incentive. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is that if we don't share the wealth, we undermine any chance to build the kind of society we want. So there is such a thing as society. There is such a thing as our mutual obligations, not only to one another and the people we know, but to the people we don't know in our society and those who are different from us, those who we don't seem like and those who have different beliefs that we will write that our our diversity is strength when we can share across our differences so there is a society or we are sunk the second theme that that you found it in thatcher you found in 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 Reagan, you found it in Mulroney, you found it in Clinton, you find it all the time, and that is government's the problem, unions are the problem, not the solution. The problem is the size of government, right? How often do you hear that? The problem is government. What we have to do is get government small. Think about that. First of all, it's based on a myth. The size of our government as a part portion of our GDP has not grown, it's shrunk. Our tax, we are a low tax country relative to Europe, relative to, to more successful countries. We are a low tax country. 
tax to GDP in Canada is below the OECD average. We are a low spending country. And we are among the lowest social spending countries of any rich country. In the list, in OECD published list of 15, we were second from the bottom. Don't believe this stuff. <laughs> Call bull stuff when you hear it. I just co coined a phrase, you like it? Bull stuff. In any case, so number one, it's a myth. Number two, it's a distraction. Why is size of government the problem? I mean, think about it. Have you ever known a politician that says, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like just for the hell of it to raise taxes and grow government really, really big. And no, nobody's arguing that. We want government big enough to do what it needs to do and resourced enough with taxes enough to do that thing. And how do we determine that thing? Democratically together. But it's not big government. Think about how silly this distraction is. Oh, yeah, it's, the problem isn't climate change. <laughs> It's the size of government. What? The problem, inequality? No, no, the, it's the size of government. You know, we want to solve our real problem, let's, let's make government smaller. The problem is the attack on government. This is a distraction. It, it has justified this notion that tax cuts are free, that there's all this waste. You want waste. You want waste. Look at the waste that deregulating the, the, the transport sector has created in unbelievable and horrific accidents, real accidents that have cost lives that are beyond waste. Look at, you want waste. Look at the Gulf spill. You want waste. Look at 2008. Let's stop looking at the private sector as some kind of model. The private sector should do private stuff and we should do public stuff and we need to expand the public. <laughs> Oh, I've got four and a half hours. Is that, am I reading that right? That, that's excellent. I can, I've got more. Um, one of, the, one of the, the, the horrible diseases of this attack on government is that somehow government's got to be more like the private sector. No. You know, here, let me take a square bracket. The Fraser Institute, every year, the Fraser Institute, Okay, the, uh, it was a, um, a moment of mourning. The Fraser, the Fraser Institute every year does a study of comparing private sector and public sector wages. Are you familiar with this? It comes out every year. And it usually comes out at the same time as some provinces publish their sun, sunshine lists of people who make up more than 100K in, in the public sector. So they make a big deal of public sector pay and how much more public sector gets paid. Well, first of all, that's just bull stuff. It's just not true. It's just not accurate. It's not accurate in any province. It's not accurate nationally. Public sector is not. Now, it is true that at the bottom of the public sector, we are slightly better off, not as much as we should be, but slightly better off than the private sector. And you know why that is? Because of commitment to pay equity. So. Because we're committed to pay equity, we've raised some jobs. And instead of yelling at us, the private sector ought to do more of the same. In fact, we ought to require it. But once you get past that, we're not paid as much. And yet they say, so in, in the midst of, of one of them, I just, every year, I just go through this horrible, painful Fraser Institute kind of reaction. I have hives and I itch. And, but, but a couple of years ago, I had a kind of respite. A blogger by the name of McGregor, also a journalist with, with The Citizen, did a, 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 an access information request to the Fraser Institute because they're, they're, they're a charitable organization, asking how many of their employees get paid $100,000 or more. Are you aware of this? Uh... So they, they answered and they said, uh, well, just about all of our economists get paid more than $100,000 of it because we, we have to compete for the best talent in the world because we need really rigorous economists. And I thought, <laughs> don't we have to do that for 
nurses and teachers, don't we have to? That logic, I buy the logic. Let's compete for the best talent in the world to teach our kids. Let's compete for the best talent in the world to police our streets. So, you know, we have, we have nothing to be ashamed of about being in the public sector. In fact, we have a lot to teach the private sector. And when, when you know, I know there's, I think, Bill 28, you know, at, at some point, some political leader is going to have to say, enough already, enough already. I want to pay my public service for excellence. <laughs> So, there's no such thing as society? Yes, there is. Government's the problem? No, government's the solution, but we do have to remake government. We have to make it, but we can't do it without investment. We can't do it by constantly cutting it and squeezing it. And the third, the third kind of dominant idea, there is no alternative. That's a, a phrase that Margaret Thatcher used all the time. They called it Tina. There is no alternative. And how often do we hear that? We have to do austerity. There is no alternative or the fisc will blow up because you know that fiscal health is much more important than human health. <laughs> there is no alternative because technology and globalization are immutable forces. Well, here's I'm going to call it Himmelfarb's golden rule because I like the sound of it. Himmelfarb's golden rule, whenever a politician tells you there is no alternative, rest assured, not only is there an alternative, but it's one you'd like a lot more if it was an offer. <laughs> you know, the, the, the big example right now is everybody's talking about the future of work. You know, AI is going to take over jobs. Or we're not going to need actual people. We're going to have just like, machines. We're going to take over. And then we're going to have nurse machines and teaching machines. And we're going to have machines building machines and machines policing machines and machines. And so, so you better be grateful that you have any job and stop asking for more money because you know you're just lucky to have anything. Well, you know, in the in the history of technological advances. That argument has always been made. You can find it 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. New technology, because that's the argument they use to make you feel like there's no alternative but lousy wages and precarious work. The truth of the matter is we've got to stop talking about the future of work as though it's inevitable. We should start talking about the future of workers, understanding we can shape it. We can make the rules for technology. We could have a 22-hour week if we chose to have it. We could do all kinds of stuff <laughs> if we made the commitment to do it. The rules of globalization are human-made. The rules of the corporate sector, we, we make corporations, we create limited liability. We create the bankruptcy laws. We could make the pensioners and the people with disabilities the first recipients on a bankruptcy. We could change all those rules. There's nothing inevitable. We have to make the choices. <laughs> that cl the, the, the clock just keeps moving like <laughs> okay, so in, you know, so I've depressed you for approximately 40 minutes, and I have a minute and a half to pull you out of the gutter, and I have nothing left. <laughs> but but let, let me talk a little bit about what I think it will take to have a new common sense, a new common sense. Because before we have new public policies, we have to have new common sense. I want a political leader that changes the story, that changes the story. And it has to start with changing our sense of what's possible, expanding the political imagination. Forty years of austerity have made us think nothing's possible. Progress is not possible. We can't make progress together. I'm sitting in a room with people, and I say, don't you think we should have universal child care, affordable, regulated? And everybody says, here, here. And then somebody inevitably says, but yeah, can we really afford it? 
Well, just about everybody else can. You know what it would take? Taxes. We could decide. We could just say yes. We have to remind people it's possible. It is possible. Everybody wants Pharmacare. Why don't we have it? We're the only country with Medicare, the only public health delivering country that doesn't have Pharmacare and dental included. How come? Because we have to expand the political imagination. We have to restore the sense of what's possible. And maybe not everything's possible at the same time, but all of it's possible over time. Second of all, we have to get clear on what our purpose is and what the purpose of public policy and unions is. And the pur you know, one of the most killing phrases for me that was coined by a fellow named Carville, who was a political advisor to, to Clinton, his, his phrase is taken like it's become conventional wisdom, it's the economy, stupid. You probably all heard that. Politics, it's the economy, stupid. And then, but making the economy as some abstraction, apart from human uh, well-being and dignity, what does that even mean? Does it mean e economic growth, however it's shared? Does it mean economic growth, whatever the cost to the planet? Does it mean that only the bottom line in eco economics matters, not respect and dignity? What does it mean? You know, we've got to turn it around. We have to stop assessing individuals on the basis of how much they contribute to the economy and start assessing the economy on how much they contribute to living individuals. It's human well-being and dignity, stupid. And then we have to be very clear what problems we're solving and we are not solving too much government. We're solving too little government. We're not solving too much taxes. In fact, we're under-resourced. We are solving climate change, deterioration of nature, intergenerational inequity, extreme inequality, precarious work, economic insecurity. Let's be clear that we are solving those problems and government's not the problem. That's, so expand the possible. Be clear about purpose understand the problems, and then absolutely commit to, to uh, the importance of collective problem solving. We're not going to solve climate change individually. We're not going to solve any of these things by giving a little bit more to charity, as good as that is. We're going to solve those by collective action on the streets, in the voluntary sector, in the unions, in our lives, and in the political choices that we make. What we need is more, I will conclude where I started, we need more democracy, not less. We need more public, not less. We need democracy in the home. We need democracy in the workplace. And we need democracy in our governments. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you, Dr. Himmelfarb, for being here today. Alex, here, here. I don't do operations. I had to get a here, here, and so. Uh, thank you for being here and sharing your experiences with us today. And thank you for that very kind uh, response. It meant a lot to me. With that, I will now turn the chair back over to President Karonsky. Thank you. Got a, one announcement. Please read instructions next time you chair. Okay. If you have not picked up your t-shirt by the bathrooms, please do so before three. If your shirt does not fit, please exchange it today as the t-shirt table will not be open tomorrow. And a reminder to please wear your t-shirts tomorrow. I'm going to take a little break. I have to go grab my t-shirt. No. So folks. If you wouldn't mind making sure that you are trying your t-shirt, make sure it's fitting. If it's not, if we can get it exchanged today. If you haven't picked yours up, please do so. 
Use your scan, your barcode, that'll uh, give you the T-shirt. Remember, if you're using this to scan the T-shirt, it is not giving you registration for convention floor. So with that, I believe we are ready to bring up the Constitution Committee back up. We have a few constitutional changes, and I have a sister on mic one. Hi, Carol Reimer, uh, Local 69. I just want to rise on a point of privilege to give the credential report. Uh, thank you so much. So we um, have the credential report. Carol, please. Uh, board and delegates, 359. Guest and honorary life members, 29. Observers and media, 17. I so move. You so move. Do we have a seconder for that? Ah, sister on mic one. Uh, Deb Jamerson, I don't have my tag on. It's at my desk. Okay. Um, I, I, I move that. I second that. Thank you. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded for the credentials report. All those in, uh, in favor all those of the credential report, please press 1 on your electronic voting device. Press 2 if you're not willing to accept it. Oh, yeah. No. Grady. If anyone sees Brother Grady, if you could let him know, his committee's up on stage. All set? All right. With that, I turn over to the committee. I believe CR 19, right? Page 20 of the book. All right, CR 19, local WRHA home care so home support. The MGU will enforce Article 30 of the Constitution, duties of stewards. Persons that are elected in the role as a steward must do or learn to do their role by being mentor and or taking education courses so they are able to act in their role. The committee recommendation is to reject the noting is mentoring and or taking education courses are not listed as a requirement under Article 30 or B22, duties of stewards, and strict enforcement of those duties that do exist may lead to the unintended consequences of dissuading individuals from taking on the position and responsibilities of steward. Nonetheless, all stewards should be encouraged to take education courses and work with and be mentored by their chief steward. This has been moved and seconded by the committee. Okay, so CR 19 moved and seconded by committee, and the committee's recommendation is one of rejection. I'm looking to the mics. Seeing no one going to the mics, please press 1 if you're in agreement of the committee's recommendation to reject. Press 2 if you're opposing the committee's recommendation. I thought you were getting your t-shirt. I was going to get you to get mine. It is carried. Thank you very much. Back to committee. CR 20, Local Social Services, Area 5. The MGU will make convention resolutions available online in advance of the convention. Because we want to be informed, and able to consult with members in advance of con oh, convention. The recommendation is to accept. In addition to the resolutions package being provided to delegates upon registration at convention, a PDF copy was made available online on the MGU website approximately two weeks in advance of convention. It is moved and seconded by the committee. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded by committee. Seeing no speakers on the mic, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to accept, press 1. In opposition, please press 2.
That is carried. Back to committee. I'll be reading CR 26. Please note that this resolution covers CR 21, CR 22, CR 23, CR 24, CR 25, CR 27, CR 28, CR 29, CR 30, CR 31, CR 32, CR 33, and CR 34. All right, that's Local going to be Prairie, a fair chunk. <laughs> Local Prairie Mountain Tech Prof Area 2, the MGEU will move to have the MGEU convention every three years and holding elections every three years for positions within the union. And the committee's recommendation is to accept, and that has been moved and seconded by the committee. <laughs> Hold on, guys, we have to get there. The, it has been moved and seconded by committee, uh, our committee's recommendation to accept, which would cover off all of those resolutions. And I see we have a lineup at the con mic, uh, brother on con on mic three. Miller, board, I rise in uh, against this recommendation. Um, since we are a member-driven organization, to be able to not talk in an open forum that we are as today. It seems we're going to be pulled away from that type of individuals after another 12 months. With the effects that the government is trying to ram down our throats, we won't be able to say our piece in an open forum for another 12 months. Now these are times where we can obviously discuss things at the board level, but we don't have the members on the floor, the front lines, making a decision that it should be all members making a decision. If this comes to being a cost factor, and we know that it is, I'm, I accept that. I want to I want to expand that. Brother or sister uh, Goronsky said that we are in a, in a very stable financial state right now, and the cost factor. I'm hoping will not be a determining factor in giving a voice to our members. I may not be popular with the board by saying this, but I believe that the members should have a right to speak in an open forum in every two years and not three. I hope that's what it's for. Thank you. Very good, brother. Sister at mic three. I'm going to follow his lead. Lynn, board. Much simpler. It would be better um, if you'd actually share your local, please. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> local 71 post-secondary component director. Um, Thank you. I went through the 17 resolutions that are combined into this, and there are a number of things came forward, and one of them was that we are one of the few unions still doing biannual conventions. Well, Very I did the research. We are not. Uh, BCGU is doing triannual, and two smaller Thanks. unions, NSGU and UPSE, are doing triannuals. Two others are doing biannuals, that's NAEP and MBEU, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and there are still a couple of unions, SGEU and OPSU, that are doing annuals. So we are not one of the few still doing biannuals, so I just want that clarified first. Um, many activists serve more than one term, so that doesn't address the educational side of things. If you're a good activist, you're going to get re-elected. If you look after your members, your members are going to re-elect you. If you don't get re-elected, maybe there's a possibility, there's a reason, and maybe you need to try harder next time. I know that sounds cruel, but that's the reality when you have a volunteer position that you get elected into. It's what you put into it is what you get out of it. Um, three years is a long time to wait for convention. The opportunity to have our voices heard and dealt with. I've heard complaints from people that our issues aren't coming aren't getting resolved because convention is so busy. Considering what it will be like if we're three years between conventions and how many things can arise in that three years, your voice is going to get lost. You are not going to be heard. We need to stick with the biannual convention. Thank you, sister. Uh, I have a sister at a pro mic. Sister. Shelley Wiggins, Local 43 Social Sciences. I'm standing in support of the committee's recommendation to accept. 
Um, I look at this as not so much a ch an opportunity to expand on or save money or things like that, but when we're looking at long-term strategic planning, sometimes you need to have more time to be able to work through those issues, to be able to, to do that plan, to follow through, and to be able to work with um, the committees and work with the different components to be able to uh, do the things that are necessary. Yes, we want to have a voice. We want to be able to speak forward on our issues. We have components. We have component directors. We have area directors who can bring those forward. The constitutional changes, if we do a good job with our strategic planning and do a good job at individual conventions and make sure that we're following our constitution, they may not be as a big of a concern. And so I would be um, recommending that the room support the committee's recommendation to accept this resolution. Thank you, sister. Brother on microphone three. Derek Pierce, Local 13, Area 5. Uh, I've sat now for eight years as uh, a steward and moved my way up. I can tell you that there's been terms where we've had people that weren't doing their job as a president or chief steward or stewards. And to have them sitting in those positions for three years, we have our, our members that are suffering because of it. So keep that in mind when you're, you're voting yes to this, if you do. Thank you, brother. We have a brother on microphone four. I'm Jake Grampo, Administration uh, Local 33, Area 7. I'm not sure if I'm pro or, or con, but I would just like us to look at, I mean, I, I think I agree with the, the two-year, but I would like us to look at alternate ways of communicating. Um, virtual meeting is an option is an option within government and should be an option, but in many cases it's not. But it's, if we want to look at ways of saving money, push that virtual meeting. Virtual meeting is not for every single meeting, but it is a definitely a viable option and a, and a good option to save money. And we can do that. I mean, particularly the biggest thing for, for, for us is that we can communicate to all the people across the province instead of only bringing people into a center like Dauphin or Thompson or Winnipeg or Brandon. I mean, there's a wonderful opportunity to connect with your people through virtual meeting. Thank you, brother. And brother, if I'm not mistaken, you're a first time speaker. I'm a first time speaker at this mic. <laughs> And we have a sister on microphone three. And I'm not a first time speaker. <laughs> um, really, Kim. <laughs> Kim Paulus, uh, Brandon University, local 135. Um, we've had our brothers and sisters get up and say how hard it is for them to get an executive. I have to twist arms at my local to get people to agree to two years. If I go back now and I tell those people that no, sorry, you've got to be here for three years. One of them I can guarantee um, she's going to retire before those three years are up. So if we're having a hard time getting people to come forward now, it's even going to be worse if it's three years. I respect the brother's uh, opinion of having um, the media or the, you know, virtual. virtual. Um, but I wouldn't want to see convention go that way. This is my only opportunity to meet with my um, brothers and sisters from Red River, UCN, to find out their ideas. I have a small local, I have 125 members, so we only have one delegate that comes, and I wouldn't want me to be gone from socialing with my brothers and sisters for three years. Thank you, sister. Sister on microphone three. Uh, Deb Jamerson, Local 26 Legal uh, Component Director and I'm standing at a con mic. Um, I'm not sure if a three-year convention, uh, moving to a three-year convention is a good thing or a bad thing. However, what I do know is that until somebody puts some hard, cold facts on the table for us as a convention, to be able to make that decision, we should stay with what we have. So there has been... Uh, um, an indication that we will save save money and yes we will over a 10-year period 
we will save the cost of one convention. That's not a lot of money. But what do we lose is what's more important to me at this point in time. Right now, every two years, we sit down, we get together, and we talk about, debate the issues. We talk about what is coming forward from government. Everything is changing, and I think that the speaker we had just before talked about it in a, in a really good way. We are being dictated to by government. We need to be sitting here on the convention floor making our plans and dictating to government what we want. A two-year convention is where we need to stay until we can have the documentation in order to make an informed decision. Thank you, sister. I'm going to go to Pro One. Sister on microphone one. Uh, Diana, Schul Diana Schultz, uh, Local 410 and Component Director for Tech Prof. We, um, at this convention, we are currently using an automated device to cast our ballot. There's many new uh, people here, new delegates here. They don't realize that in the past, we have had the debate about whether we should move to uh, an automated device for casting our ballots. There was a lot of resistance. I hear the resistance here for moving to a three-year term, but we know from our sister provinces that it is effective to go to a three-year term. There is proof in the pudding that it makes sense to go to a three-year term. And because of that, I would offer up that progression does mean change. And I know sometimes change can be hard, but this is, in my opinion, this would be a good change. And I do ask that you accept the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, sister. I'm gonna go to brother on microphone three. Len Van Roon, Local 133, Manitoba Museum. I was at the last convention, and uh, no general resolutions made it to the floor. I do have a concern in terms of the operation of the convention. If we're meeting every three years and there's financial and constitutional obligations, those will necessarily take precedence. Uh, I'm sitting at a table with two other small locals who have really severe issues with casual employment, part-time employment over the half of their workforce. And there was a great resolution last time that got forwarded to the board, but it wasn't heard. And my, my seatmate and myself were prepared to speak to that last time. So I do have a concern in terms of with the business of the union that has to be done if we go to every three years. I'm afraid that it would deprive of a, of a chance to talk about some really important things. And you know, if there's 30 resolutions, and only three make it to the floor in a category, they can still be prioritized and we still get to talk about them and educate others about them. So I think that's a very important thing. The other thing is, on the local shop floor, we, we do have trouble recruiting people to be stewards and vice presidents. And uh, there's an issue if we're going three years, it's gonna put us into bargaining. So we need to, we need to look at, at the impact right on the shop floor of what this move of, from three to two means. So I'm, I'm uh, Definitely not in favor of it, and I think that until we do more research, we should look at two. Thank you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Going over to the sister on microphone four. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Amanda Macbeth, Local 420 Tech Prov. I rise to speak in favor of going to three years. Um, First of all, uh, when I went through and I did a quick count here, and it's probably not completely accurate, but it looked like 15 different locals put forward this exact proposal. Now, what I've noticed is that that's a lot for one specific issue. The next thing is, is that cost is really important, especially in the times that we're in, all the money that we have uh, and that we're spending campaigning, dealing with the way that the government is coming at us, is that I feel that we need to be wise with our finances. Someone mentioned that it's going to be hard to find people to commit. You know, and if someone's not willing to do that extra year, then that means that 
we've got to either talk more with our people or we need to find other people that are going to be involved. Because there's some people that say, well, I would do one year, but I won't do two. Does that mean we go to one year? No, it means that we, I'm a president and I know what it's like and the difficulty it is to get quorum, but I'm out there working my butt off to make that happen. And that's what it means to be part of the union. And if someone doesn't want to do that, then maybe they shouldn't be part of it. And I know that's tough to hear, but it's true. My next question is, is that I want to know how much does this actually cost? Doug, can you speak generally? Is what does this convention cost put on? general terms, it uh, has run in the uh, 600 to 700 thousand dollars. 600 to 700 thousand. If we go on strike, how much does that buy us? How many people does that pay? I want to know. Like, think about that. So the decisions that we make here are really important. We talk about, you know, having, you know, swag to give out to people. Six or 700 thousand is a lot of money in swag to be encouraging our members and helping them to be using that to keep our dues low. I think that this is an important proposal and I think that if we're having an issue with someone has been elected that they're not effective at their job, um, then the question is, is that why were they elected in the first place? And that means that we have to do a good job of educating our members and of the importance of who they pick because it matters. And it matters for one year, it matters for one day, it matters for two years, it matters for three years. So it doesn't matter if we go an extra year, if they're bad, two years is a long time. We gotta do a better job of that. So I'm speaking out in favor of going to three years. I think it's important that we're wise with our finances. And I think that we have so many opportunities for communication now. And the MGU is doing an amazing job of that. I've only been involved for a couple of years. And I think that we need to really step out and do this. Thank you. Sister. That was a pro, I'm going to a con. Brother on microphone three. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Lipson. I'm the Vice President of Local 256 Government Community Workers. Thank you all for a wonderful first convention, by the way. First time speaker. And it's to that point that I rise in objection uh, of this current topic. If we move convention to three years instead of two, quite frankly, it'll eliminate participation in people my age in young members of the union. And on that basis, I rise in objection. Thank I you, brother. Be here. Brother on microphone one. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Wright, local 26 legal, and it's my first time at the mic. Hey, let's go. Um, with respect to the healthy debate going on both sides, uh, I think this is an issue that needs looking into a little bit more. I'd like to make a motion to refer this back to the board. There's been a motion to refer. Sorry. Do we have and a seconder? I'd, I'm sorry? We have a, you're, you're yeah, and so I'm, I'm proposing with that motion that a committee be struck to research the implications, um, both pro and con, uh, and to cost out what the three-year convention would be, um, that a half day be added to the 2020 convention review uh, and discuss the outcomes, um, and that the info will be provided to convention delegates in September of 2020, um, that the community, um, the committee, pardon me, will be gender balanced and diverse as well. So, brother, just on that, you said mentioned September of 2020. Did you mean October when we do our convention? Thank you. Yes. No, no, no. Thank no, you. No. Ahead. Ahead, Ahead of. The information before is, is provided to the, uh, the delegates before convention. Oh, the dele oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. So we've got a mover to refer to the uh, board, incoming board with direction. Do we have a seconder? Second Deb Jamerson, uh, legal component director, local 26, and I second that. Okay, and Katie, I heard you too, you second that. So we've got two seconders for this one. Um, any discussion on the direction of where the referral is going? Seeing none, all those in favor of referral to the incoming board with instruction? Please press one. Those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Thank you so very much, brother. Awesome. Back to committee then. 35. C CR 35, Terranet Area 7. 
the MGU will amend 29.3a to read January and September of each biannual convention year to elect for two year terms, table officers, stewards and members at large and to deal with other business as necessary. Delete 29.3bi. The committee's recommendation is to reject. Elections should take place within a reasonable time prior to assuming office and carrying out the responsibilities of the position. Article 2903BI provides a mechanism for locals who experience challenges meeting in September due to seasonal work demands to request special approval for the election of table officers, stewards and members at large to take place earlier. Moved and seconded. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded by committee. Recommendation of rejection. Seeing no speakers at the mic. All those in favor of accepting the committee's recommendation to reject, please press 1. Those in opposition, please press 2. is carried back to committee CR 36 component component executive administration the MGU will no longer require the need for a standing vote for constitutional resolution during convention <coughs> however the ability to request a standing vote should still be available upon, upon request the committee's recommendation is to reject and the note is that this resolution has already been fulfilled when Article 19.5 was added at the last 2016 convention to permit electronic voting in the same format as provided for under Article 19.02a. Furthermore, a poll vote can be made by a motion as per Article 19.04. Moved and seconded. It's been moved and seconded by committee. Committee's recommendation is one of rejection. Seeing no speakers at the mic, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to reject, please press 1. Those opposing, please press 2. We're going to get them done. And that is carried. Back to committee. CR 37, Local Prairie Mountain RHA HSS Area 2. The MGU will allow the President, Chief Steward, and Vice President an automatic spot to convention in addition to the allotted number of spots to convention for local. The committee's reject or sorry, the committee's recommendation is to reject with a note. Local table officers are able to be nominated and elected by their local membership to attend as a convention delegate. The proposed Resolution could result in more than twice the number of delegates at convention, leading to significant cost implications. Furthermore, it takes away from the proportional representation. And this also covers CR 38. Moved, moved and seconded. It's been moved and seconded by committee. Committee's recommendation is to reject. Seeing no speakers going to the mics, all those in favor of accepting the committee's recommendation? Please press 1. Those opposing, please press 2. That is carried. Back to committee. Three more of these. Mm -hmm. CR 38, WRHA Home Care Home Support. The MGU will let, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Alberto. CR 39, get through it even quicker. WRHA Home Care Home Support. The MGU will let more members go to convention. Each local can send one delegate for its first 75 members and for each additional 75 members. The committee's recommendation is to reject Please note there was concerns that smaller locals with less than 75 members that would still only get one delegate under the proposed resolution 
would minimize their voice along with the financial implications of significant increase in the overall delegate count. Committee so moves and seconds. It's been moved and seconded by committee. Recommendation of reject. Wasn't sure. Seeing no speakers going to the mic, all those in favor of accepting the committee's recommendation to reject, please press one. Those opposing, please press two. And that is carried. Thank you. Back to committee. CR 40, Trades Area 7. The MGU will consider moving middle management to their own local. Committee recommendation of this is referred to the Board of Directors of the incoming board with the note Board of Directors to consider and review the implications of creating separate locals for middle management including financial implications and changes to union structure and representation. The committee is moved and seconded. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded by committee for referral to the incoming board. Seeing no speakers at the mic, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to refer to the incoming board, please press 1. Those opposing, please press 2. I want to do an Alex Trebek. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and that is carried. And in the history of an MGU convention, we are on our last mm -hmm. <laughs> CR resolution. Whoa. C All right. <laughs> We have not achieved this in a great number of years. <laughs> CR 41, back CR to committee. CR 41. <laughs> Local collect corrections area one. The MGU will place supervisors in a separate local. Committee recommendation is to refer to the board of directors with the note, board of directors to consider and review the implications of creating separate locals for supervisors, including financial implications and changes to union structure and representation, as well as identifying which members and or classifications perform the duties of a supervisor. The committee has moved and seconded this. It has been moved and seconded by committee, one of referral to the incoming board of directors. Any discussion on the direction of the referral? Seeing absolutely no one going to any mic anywhere. Uh, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to refer to the incoming board, press one. Press two if you're opposing at now. It is carried, and with that, we can thank down our committee and appreciate and thank you so very much. We will step down. Thank you. Woohoo! Your incoming board appreciates you, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> All right. So, next up, I'm going to ask Sister Charlotte if she would please come up. The next two resolutions. Just a moment, please. Well, they read my mind. Yes. I was going to call them to come up, but uh, good job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, can I get you guys to turn to page 224? And we will start with the membership education resolutions. And take it away, Shelley. This book. Oh, sorry. Okay. 
Um, while oh. everybody is finding their page in their resolution book, I'll just take the opportunity to introduce our committee. So representing area one is Riley Box. Um, representing area two is Teresa Hardy. Representing area three is Kim Fallis. Representing area four, Michelle Mansell. Representing area five, Derek Pierce. Representing area six, Brenda Miskew. You're not your whole report, right? No, we aren't. Okay. Representing <laughs> area seven, JP Lapointe. And representing area eight, Sherry Bonfoy. I also want to acknowledge our uh, past committee members who have moved on to other opportunities from area one, Darlene Adamson and Jillian Karpik. And from area four, Wally Fletcher. And from area seven, Marius Miska. So we're moving on to resolution MC number one. Okay. Your resolutions book. 224. So uh, the MGU will develop additional educational resources to help activists to communicate with members of different cultural and language groups. The committee's recommendation is to accept as amended and just noted there that educational resources could include clear English facts or Q&A sheets with information about the union, collective agreement, common union terms, and community resources for newcomers, etc. So again, the committee's recommendation is to accept as amended. Moved. Moved and seconded by the committee. All right, so MC1 has been moved and seconded. Seconded? Seconded. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just doing good. quit while I'm ahead here? Okay, that word I'm trying to say. Um, the committee recommendation is to accept as amended. And I see a speaker, a delegate at mic number four. Hi, my name is April Peterson. First time at the mic. Woo! Um, <laughs> my local is 47 and uh, area 7. And I'd like to ask a point of privilege when we would do the emergency resolutions. Is mic number four on? You need to be closer. Oh, Sorry. could you just step a little closer? Yes. Thanks. Uh, April Peterson, um, area yeah, local 47, area seven. I'd like to raise a point of privilege and ask when the emergency resolutions would be. Go on. on over. So, oh, did you want? Um, they will be covered during the general resolutions. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, anyone? Okay, seeing no one at the mic. So we'll pull out our little magic click, oh wait, voting devices. <laughs> Sorry you guys. Um, so if the recommendation from the committee is to accept as amended. If you are in favor, please plus one. And if you are opposed, press two. I blame the drugs. Oh, you guys didn't hear that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Can I be excused? <laughs> All right, and, <laughs> and that, that resolution passes. All right. Moving on to MC2. The MGU will allow shop stewards and other activists to be allowed to be uh, be allowed to be allowed. More than four education days currently provided. The committee's recommendation is referred to the board of directors. This resolution should be discussed by the board of directors in the context of potential costs, financial resources, facilitator availability, and the union's strategic priorities. This resolution is covered in MC3. Moved and seconded by the committee. All right. Okay, the recommendation, or part has been moved and seconded. So, the recommendation from the committee is referred to the board of directors. Do I see anybody at the mics? All right. So if you are in favor of the committee recommendation to refer to the board of directors, please plus, press one. And if opposed, press two. 
and I'm having problems with my peas. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is going to be a little bumpy, guys. <laughs> and I see that resolution passes. This is really going to be bumpy. Okay, so going on to MC4, I'll try to get this one right, you guys. This is local Perry Mountain EMS Area 3. The MGEU will offer more educational opportunities for non-activists such as new member orientations in a workplace delivered by elected workplace representatives, lunch and learn sessions, short presentations at local <coughs> meetings or area council, etc. And the committee recommended accept as amended. Amended. <laughs> Sketchy. And we seconded. Sorry. No, we seconded. We moved to second. Moved second. and seconded. Okay, we moved and seconded. This is my first time, you guys. Give me a break. <laughs> I'm waiting for the hook to come take me off stage here. All right, that's been uh, moved and seconded. The committee recommendation is to accept as amended. And I have a speaker delegate on mic number one. Len Van Roon, Local 133, Manitoba Museum, I'm Vice President. I'll give you a 30 second break so that you can recompose yourself here from speaking. I, I was going to get up on that one of the shop steward uh, motions earlier on that uh, talked about uh, educating shop stewards so that they could get more uh, practical experience in mentoring. and. Uh, one of the key reasons I was going to get up is so I could thank our education department for the exceptional You and Your Union course that I started with as an activist before I became a steward. Thank you so much. In two years since, I've had my four courses each year, and uh, I think that the, edu the education is exceptionally important, and I would like to see it broaden because it's kind of a big step for some of our, our new members to get access to finding about the, moon the union and some of the some of the specific areas, so uh, I strongly support this recommendation and I, th I think with creativity we can reach beyond the excellent courses that we've been given and reach more of our members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no speakers at the mics, we will go to vote. If you are in favor of the committee recommendation to accept as amended, please, please press one. And if opposed, press two, please. I still got one more to go. <laughs> no. All right, and that resolution resolution has passed. All right. So I'd like to thank the membership of education committee for coming up. Good job, everybody. And next up is the Pension and Benefits Committee. Can I? Okay, I got practice with All right, Ed, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. I'll just introduce the members of the committee that's here right now. On my right is Kevin Kotick. Uh, to his right is Dave Hill. And Bob Wells. Oh, I'm just 
Maybe I can see now. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Now I forget her name, though. No. Shirley. 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 Shirley who? Rush, then. That's so. Oh, we're starting early, I guess. And it's not even Saturday. Yes. Okay, we'll start with uh, resolution uh, PC1 and local health area 7. The MGU will advocate for all current civil service members to remain within the civil service superannuation board. Pension plan, regardless of the employer changes that might occur in the health care sector. Our recommendation is to reject and the uh, reasoning, the potential health care vote regarding bargaining agents will not affect the pension to which the employees contribute. The participation in a pension plan is an agreement between the employer and the pension plan. The bargaining agent cannot alter this arrangement unless the employer agrees to it. This would become a bargaining issue if the membership felt that they would be better served under a different pension plan. And the committee so moves and seconds. All right, it's been moved and seconded. So the committee recommendation is to reject. Is there any speakers? All right. So if you are in favor of rejecting, or pardon me, accepting the committee recommendation to reject, press one. If you are opposed, press two. And that one passes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Kevin Kotick here, um, Area 3, Golico, uh, presenting Resolution PC2. The MG will explore federating benefits across the union. The committee recommendation is to reject. The committee recognizes the challenges smaller locals have in acquiring quality benefits. However, the committee feels that this is a bargaining issue and the administrative challenges and barriers in a bargaining agent taking on health benefits for such a large membership would be problematic. The committee is also concerned that in alleviating the employer's responsibility in providing benefits to its employees would open the door to setting a precedent with unintended consequences where the employer would back away from providing other benefits outside of health and insurance to employees. And um, this is moved and seconded by committee to reject. All right, it's been moved and seconded. The committee recommendation is to reject. If you are in favor of the committee recommendation to reject, press one. If you are opposed, oh, okay, I'm gonna slow down. <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. Uh, speaker on mic number three. Hi, JP. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Chair. That was not deliberate, J just no, for the no, record. No, no, it's, it's all good. Uh, JP LaPointe, MPI Area 7. Um, one of the things that I discovered this year traveling around was that we do have a lot of small locals. And although they have access to some of the benefits that the rest of us have at a place like MPI, where we have the weight to negotiate and where we can pay the kind of prices Blue Cross asks to get the kind of great benefits we get, these guys don't get that. If we were to take this on as a union as a whole and negotiate a single price for a larger benefit package for the group of us, not only would we likely get a better deal, that would mean people in home care, for example, might yes. get access to some of the benefits I have. I think you should consider this. I think we should study it. I'm not saying doing it tomorrow, but I think it's something we need to start looking at. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are you referring that one? Is he referring that? Oh, I'm sorry. JP. JP, were you referring that? Incoming board. Or to the in That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, I will. <laughs> thank you. Do we have a second? Oh, my bad. He can't refer it. Hang on then. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh. Just a moment. Hang 
chair recognizes delegate number one. Michelle Gronsky, president, and I would like to refer that to the incoming board as well as the uh, Pensions Benefits Committee for review and bring back. All right, is there a second? Uh, Mike, number three. Oh, Derek Pierce, Corrections, Local 13. I second that. Thank you. Okay, the motion's been made to refer to the board and the Pension and Benefits Benefit Committee. It has been moved and second. Is there... Uh, delegate number one. Uh, I have a concern about the uh, the referral. The referral should also include the superannuation insurance to the liaison committee, as it is the committee that negotiates the benefits with the employer. Are you making an amendment? Very friendly, yes. Very friendly. <laughs> Do we have a second for the very friendly amendment? Yeah. Uh, Mike number three. Derek Pierce, Local 13, Area 5. Sorry, buddy. Uh, I second that. All right. Okay, let's see if I can remember this. Okay, the... It's been... Mo uh, sorry, we're going to vote on the amendment. Friendly amendment. So... I should have wrote this down better. So all those in favor of the amendment, um, press 1. And if opposed, press two. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, the, the amendment would be to refer to the board, the Pension Benefit Committee, and the superannuation, superannuation Insurance Liaison Committee. What he said. <laughs> To the incoming board. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, so we're just adding silk to the referral. Forget the part where I said about the incoming board. Are we all confused now? Okay. I'm going to do this one more time. The, we're going to vote on the amendment, friendly amendment, for it to go to refer to the board, the Pension Benefit Committee. Oh, sorry, just silk. Right. Okay, we're voting on the friendly amendment just to add silk to the referral. Press one if you are in favor, and press two if you are opposed. Somebody, please grab the hook. <laughs> All right, the friendly amendment of adding silk passes, and now we will vote on the referral. And we have a speaker on mic three. Lorelai Hebert, Local 113, Home Care. I just want to know what silk is. Oh. Superannuation Insurance Liaison Committee. It is the committee that negotiates improvements to the pension and benefit plans with the employer. Okay, so we're voting for the referral to the board, the pension and benefits committee, and the silk. No speakers at the mic. Uh, those in favor, press one. Opposed, press two. <laughs> I'm not going to comment. <laughs> no. <laughs> Haven't you guys been through enough? <laughs> All right, and that passes. The referral to the board's pass. And the uh, last one, you guys, lucky you. Number three. PC3, local uh, 
Winnipeg RHA Home Care Home Support. The MGU will, um, through the Association of Manitoba Federal La Federation of Labour and the Union, National Union Public of General Employees, lobby the government to introduce low income senior or sen single pensioners to get a separate financial supplement. Committee recommends to accept. Notes, there are numerous benefits and programs available to low income seniors, most notably the following. Guaranteed income supplement allowance, allowance for survivor. Manitoba 55 plus implements, implements and increases to GIS and allowance for survivor benefits were implemented recently. The committee is concerned that this group may not be aware of the benefits available to this section of the population and due to the lack of specified specificity in this resolution, the Pension and Benefits Committee would be pleased to discuss arranging an information session for members of the WRHA Home Care and Home Support about programs available for low-income seniors. Even though there are programs in place, the committee feels that there is a merit to explore what imp imp improvements can be made to the existing programs, as well as advocating for new supports for low-income seniors. Moved and seconded by committee. All right, that has been moved and second. Seeing no one at the mics. The committee recommendation is to accept those, oh, sorry. Okay, delegate on number three. Hi. Okay, so this was my resolution and working in home care, oh, sorry. Bye, Con. <laughs> Hi, pro. <laughs> so, delegate on number one. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Brenda Miskew. Everybody already knows that. Uh, area 6, local 113. So the reason I, this, because we're in home care, we see a lot of, we work with a lot of seniors and we help a lot of seniors. And I don't think these seniors are chosen to be in poverty. They're just p p people that worked all their lives and have no other income coming in but their pensions, which is, we all know, very low. So I just thought that maybe we can help with um, La Manitoba Labor Federation Labor Board that we can maybe help or come up with another assistance that can help them. Because I don't think that people that lived and worked all their lives like we are should have to live in poverty. Okay. Thank you. All right, seeing no other speakers at the mics. Uh, the committee recommend recommendation is to accept so please plus press one if you are in favor press two if are opposed okay. all right and that passes um, Ed you just want you had that word I have to take my glasses off again to see. I, I neglected to mention one of our members that uh, snuck in behind me, Anne-Marie Boutreau. <laughs> and of course, we wouldn't have a committee without the, uh, the expertise of uh, Sam uh, Krobitz. And I just want to acknowledge them as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. So thank you, delegates. I appreciate your patience with me going through this. Um, but I'm going to turn the chair over to Wayne. <laughs> All right, delegates, we're going to call up the Safety and Health Committee now. So, and I believe Janet Keeler has an announcement she'd like to make. Hi, the questions for the All Candidates Forum, we're going to go through those right now and we will be in the room where we had lunch. 
So for those that are scrutineering, you can meet me there now. Thank you. So if the Safety and Health Committee could make their way up to the stage, that would be great. Everyone enjoying convention? <laughs> Getting lots done? Yes, it's good, it's great. All right, it looks like the committee is up on stage, so I'll turn this over to Charlotte. Hello again. <laughs> I fooled you. I'm actually going to turn this over to my committee. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Noted and understood. <laughs> so I would just like to um, introduce my committee members that are not here. So from Area 1, Mike Tavner. Uh, area 3, Brian Latimer. Area 4, Evelyn Green. Area 5, Susan Smirchansky. And I'd like to acknowledge um, my brother in the back there, Steve Smith, who yes. retired um, but was on our committee. <laughs> and I would like to let my committee introduce themselves. I got a red light. Bev Smith, Area 6, uh, Local 113, Home Care. Joe Dooley. Oh, okay, never mind. They want to applaud for you a little more. There. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Joe Dooley, Area 7. <laughs> oh, Susan Granbois, Area 2. My name is Blaine Duncan. I'm the Safety and Health Specialist on staff at MGU mm -hmm. and support the committee. So if we can now read the resolution. The MGU will increase the number of safety and health educationals to accommodate the training of workplace safety and health committee members and chief stewards. Because many of our seasonal workers do not get the training and all the members require the education and training to fulfill their roles and responsibilities as workplace safety and health committee members. Committee recommendation referred to the board. Note, further investigation is necessary to determine the viability of hosting safety and health courses during the summer season work period. Moved and seconded. Okay. So that's been moved and seconded by committee to refer to the board of directors. Is there any speakers at the mic to speak on referring it to the board of directors? If not, take your device, press one if you're in favor of the recommendation to, to refer to the board of directors and press two if you're opposed to the recommendation to refer to the Board of Directors. And that is passed. Awesome. All right. Thank you to the committee. You can now step down. And we'd like to call up. If we could now call up the Equity and Human Rights Committee. Sorry, I'm showing my age. Equality and Human Rights Committee. It used to be the Equity and Human Rights Committee. These are on page 43 of your resolutions book, back in between the Constitution resolutions and the finance resolutions. Okay. 
All right, we'll let, turn this over to the Equality and Human Rights Chairperson, Diane Arksey. Here goes. Uh, just want to thank our committee. Not all of us are here, but uh, area one is Roger Navis. Area two, Brandon McKay, who is here. Area three, Carol Grant to my right. Area four, Catherine Gibbs. Area five, David Pankritz. Uh, area six, it is vacant. Seven, Michael Weffley. Eight, Michael Tabin. And myself, Diane Arksey, the chair. And thanks to our staff, uh, Scott Cloney and Lisa Scherer. This one's all me. <laughs> Local Social Sciences Area 7. I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> there we go. The MG will organize, develop a standing committee for persons who live with a disability. The committee's recommendation is to reject with a note the Equality and Human Rights Committee represents persons who live with a disability as one of their mandates. The committee is actively working on accessibility and issues affecting persons with disabilities. The committee welcomes input from all members. Uh, we move and second. All right, that's been moved and seconded by committee. I see, I'm gonna start with the speaker on con three and then come over to con mic two. Speaker on con three. Hi, uh, Donovan, uh, area seven, local 14. Um, I've been made aware that the MGU members that attend national conventions or CLC cannot actually sit on the disability caucus there because MGU does not have its own separate disability caucus or committee. All right. Okay. Speaker on mic two. Welcome to marginalization oppression. This was my resolution. I'm a person that lives with a disability in 1990. I was driving down a highway in Saskatchewan, get hit by a car, and my life changed forever. I was on CPP disability for 18 years and decided to go back to school. So yes, I sustained a brain injury and that's why I'm now a social worker. Um, <laughs> I won two national scholarships, so I'm just saying workers with disabilities have abilities. And the government does say that, they don't follow it, okay? And so what I, what I, the reason why I'm saying a standing committee is, okay, sorry. It's very often, okay, uh, accessibility, sorry, I'm very nervous. I'm a first time speaker at this conference. <laughs> My biggest mistake is I wrote down a whole bunch of facts, okay? We shouldn't be in books, and believe it or not, I'm in, a, I'm in a book called The Canada Millennium Foundation, A Million Futures, because I won top national scholarships after sustaining a brain injury. I couldn't go to school before the injury because my marks weren't good enough. I guess it knocked some sense into me. All kidding aside, I finished with a 4.2 GPA and unfortunately my abilities are not seeing my disability as I had Assistant Deputy Minister state to me, uh, reasonable accommodations means it's not unreasonable to push you as hard as we can. No, that's illegal, it's against the law. Okay, I, things started to change in my favor after she made that statement. Okay, um, also another thing that I wanna make, um, we need a place, we need, we need our own home, we need, I have so many workers that came up to me after the MFL saying we're so supportive of this. I have so many workers here. If you're not a person that lives with a disability, you know at least one, two, three, four or more colleagues that live with disabilities and the ones that you don't know, five, six, seven, eight just haven't said it and why? I don't blame them for not saying it because boy did I meet discrimination. I got hired, so, so we need our own committee. We need a standing committee to be a voice for us. We need a place that we can call home and not to be watered down. The accessibility for Manitobans Act came in. It, it wasn't put under any other name of uh, equities or diversity, it was for people with disabilities. Please, please vote no on this one. Please, that's my life. I want to work. That's all I want to do. Thank you, Larry. 
Seeing no one at a pro mic, speaker on mic three. Good afternoon, Annette Liss, uh, Local 144, Area 5, St. River School Division Support. Not my first time at a mic, but my first time here. Um, I just want to uh, try and figure out how to say this. Equal or the Equality and Human Rights Committee is wonderful, but when it comes to disabilities, equality doesn't work. Because if I'm in a wheelchair, I can only get into certain places. Whether I am Aboriginal or a person of color or um, LGBT, I can still get into that place. But if I have a mobility issue, I can't. If I am blind, I need accommodations that I don't need because of the color of my skin or my sexual um, identity. If I am deaf, I need accommodations because I cannot hear, not because of the color of my skin, or my sexual identity, etc. Disability or a disabled person needs something other than what this committee can offer. And I think that this is a very important resolution. I think that our disabled members need to have their own voice because um, I have been a special needs advocate for many years. I am a parent of a special needs child. And I do not have the right or the ability to make decisions based on what I think is good for him. He needs to be the one to tell me what he needs. He needs to be the one that tells me what I need to advocate for. And as good as our intentions are, unless we actually are affected by a disability, we cannot begin to be the ones who are saying this is the way it should be. So I think that everybody here needs to support or sorry, to vote against the rejection of this resolution and does need to support us having a separate committee for disabled workers. Thank you. Speaker on mic three. Good afternoon, my name is Camille Berthlet, first time speaker. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to speak on this. Uh, I sit on the provincial board for the Manitoban, or Society for Manitobans with Disabilities. I have had the encounter of uh, grievance with my employer because of my disability, which took over a year and a half, and much stress and much, much um, anxiety grew within me and caused more uh, damage than anything possible. I think a person with a disability should be, um, I don't know what's, what's the proper word I should be using. We need to be sensitive with people with disabilities. And I'm gonna follow what the brother said at the other microphone. I agree, we do need to have a separate entity for people living with disabilities. I do believe that we do need to be represented individually. Thank you. Sorry, uh, speaker on microphone one. Thank you, Michelle Gronsky, president. And I don't disagree with this in any way, shape, or size. But to make this type of a change, if the re committee's recommendation is not um, uh, agreed to, that means then it comes back and the committee would be having to restructure. But this then would mean building a standing committee, which is a constitutional change. Mm -hmm. A resolution cannot come to the floor this year. It would have to wait. And then we would also have to have two thirds vote on it. So what I am asking is that we refer this to the incoming board to work with the committee and Manitobans with disabilities, as well as any member willing to step up to be able to share with us what their needs and stuff would be so that we've got further instruction on what we're looking at 
and this does not get shut down, but actually gets really looked into and gives us some time to create what would properly represent Manitobans and our members. Right. So that was a motion to refer to the Board of Directors with instructions. Uh, do I have a seconder to that referral? Okay, can someone go to the mic? Oh, microphone three. Derek Pierce, corrections, local 13. I will second that motion and hold my talk to myself. All right. All right. Are there any speakers to the motion to refer to the Board of Directors? Seeing none at the mics, if you are in favor of the motion to refer to the Board of Directors, press one. If you are opposed to the motion to refer to the Board of Directors, press two. And, and this has passed. All right. Now. Sorry, who called them? Okay. Yeah. All right. Next resolution. All right. Local Social Sciences Area 7. The MGU will develop an ad hoc committee for workers who live with a disability. The committee's recommendation was to reject with a note the Equality and Human Rights Committee represents persons who live with a disability as one of their mandates. The committee is actively working on accessibility and issues affecting persons with disability and the, community, the committee welcomes input from all members. All right, speaker at con mic two was there first. We'll start there. Oh, consolation prize. This was my second, uh, second amendment or second resolution. Um, the reason why I feel in the meantime, while we wait for the next conference, workers like me get older. And, and uh, that's right, I turned 60 in August and I'm running 60 kilometers as a fundraiser. So. Um, so what I'm going to say is brain, uh, uh, people with disabilities represent one of the highest grievances against our employers. Okay, people, uh, uh, human rights complaints, one of the largest human rights complaints are people with disabilities. That's why we need an ad hoc committee. And the Horrocks decision from Northern Health just uh, uh, that took effect. I basically feel that's a union busting event. You can either, you either in the, uh, have the union represent you or you have um, uh, uh, human rights. And this new, oh yeah, and well, don't get me started on human rights. Okay, in fact, your human rights can be violated, but yet you get no representation because you're with the MGU. Okay, you get no protection under human rights. We need a committee, we need a voice. We don't need a voice in two years, we need a voice now. And we. <laughs> Young members started as an ad hoc committee. Why can't we tomorrow? And I want to put my name forward to chair of that committee if we ever get accepted. Thank you very much. Please vote no, because we need the committee now. We don't need another two years. Speaker on mic one. And again, Michelle Gronsky, President, and Larry, please bear with me. An ad hoc committee can be struck at any time through the board of directors. So once again, I'm going to refer this to the Board of Directors to be taking a, a serious look at this ASAP. Okay, do we have a seconder to that motion? Yeah, I'll second it, Larissa, and uh, Local 73. All right, are there any speakers to the referral? All those in favor of referring this to the Board of Directors, press one. If you are opposed to referring this to the wait, Board of Directors. Wait, wait. Oh, okay, we have another speaker. Uh, Jake Grempo, again, administration, local 33. Uh, one quick concern, I'm 
okay with it going to get referred to the board of directors um, but the ASAP doesn't sorry no disrespect but doesn't mean anything because ASAP can be years I would like to have a timeline so I don't know if that's an amendment but that, maybe we can get a timeline put in there that would be an amendment okay can we do an amendment to the whatever it's called the how long would you like it to be 30 days Ooh. 30 days Ooh, 30 days is Hey, our union no. contract says that an employer, when there's a safety, health, safety and health issue, the, they have to respond there's, within. There's, there's not going to be a board meeting, though, within that time. There's Why not going to be a board of directors meeting within you, 30 days of you, today. You heard the concerns. I myself live with disability, although I don't like that statement that I'm living with a disability because that means I'm blaming my wife that she's got the disability. <laughs> But I have bipolar and I accept it and that's what it is and it's got challenges. Okay. Having so, said that, can we do it in a 30 day time limit? 90 well, days? Yeah. Are yeah. you okay with that? 90 days? All right. Can we do an amendment for 90 days? All right. So, so we have a friendly amendment to move it to 90 yes, days. Friendly. Seconder? Uh, Stephanie Swain, I'm from St. Amant uh, All right. Community Residence Program. I'll second. Any discussion on the time period of 90 days? If not, all those in favor of adding to reply within 90 days, press 1. Opposed to within 90 days, press 2. And that is carried. So now we're back to the referral. Any other speakers to the referral to the board of directors in 90 days? I have someone coming to the mic. Hi, sorry, um, Rob Burnett, uh, 14. Sorry, first time in the mic. Area 7, local 14. It's my first convention. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's been a good experience so far. There's been a lot of times that uh, we're hearing from people up there coming down and shoving it to a referral real fast. And maybe that's just due to the level of experience they have uh, in doing this, and they know that that's the best method to handle it. Um, there's been times, though, that me and the group, crew that I'm with back here strongly disagree. This is one of them. Um, <laughs> we keep hearing referral. My question about the referral is when do we hear back? I mean, we keep hearing about the two years, but there's been things that aren't even tabled, is my understanding, that were referred last convention that aren't coming up this one. So when are we going to hear back? Everything was okay. I mean, we, we heard how much this impacts that gentleman. He's clearly not the only one. I mean, especially what I work in, corrections, we do have a lot of people who have growing issues as your career develops in terms right. of disabilities, mental health, so. For sure. So, so now with the addition of the 90 days, the board's going to need to make a decision within 90 days on the ad hoc committee and res they need to be responding back. All right. So that is, there is a timeline there and it needs to be done. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right. No further speakers at the mic to vote in favor of the referral to the Board of Directors to respond back within 90 days, press 1. If opposed to the referral to the Board of Directors responding back in 90 days, press 2. Okay, and that is carried. So that is referred to the board. All right, and with that, we'll step down the Equality and Human Rights Committee, and I will pass the chair over to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you very much, brother.
Um, I do want to address a couple of, of things that were now that have been brought forward, and I so appreciated the brother coming to the mic to talk about when we're referring and we're stepping down and making sure that the referrals are done, and it seems to be very quickly. And I, I very much appreciate hearing that, and you're right, it is because, well, some of us have been around a long time, so we understand what's going on. And I apologize that perhaps I should have explained this a little bit ahead of time. The reason that I will get down and refer something uh, is so that it never, it doesn't get lost. Because if, if the, uh, I want to say congregation, delegation um, actually rejects what the committee's recommendation is and then the committee has to come back with a recommendation to remove something or to change something, then I'm always worried that we would lose something along the way. If the, if the convention floor actually approves something without knowing a true cost factor to it in doing my due diligence as the president, I want to make sure that the board is taking a good look at it, that we're looking at what it financially it will cost, as well as any moral or any other implication that it would have on any of our members. So I so appreciated hearing that from you, brother, and knowing that. So know that it's not, the referrals are not being done to shut it down, but actually to allow us to make sure that we are getting full information and we'll be able to bring it back. The other one that you did bring up was about resolutions from last convention not hearing about. Every re uh, resolution from the last conv convention was dealt with, whether it was the floor of the convention or the board of directors after convention. Letters went out to each and every local. For the first time ever we'd done that, we sent it out to every local to let them know where their resolution was and what happened, where it landed. So if you had put forward a resolution and you never heard back, please let me know because we'd have to look into finding out where it is. We sent no. the, the answer back to the president of every local so that the local would know what was going on. I was echoing sentiments that I heard from people that have brought forward a serious concern last convention. And maybe that's the case. I will okay. find out more on that. But it still does feel like it's just getting lost okay. when, you, when you do that. So. I make the no, I, just, I just want to make that abundantly clear. Yeah. And, and I so appreciate hearing that and I give you the commitment that whatever does happen with where this goes, you will absolutely the delegates will know at next convention for sure, but any local that brought anything forward, their letter will be given to them well in advance. Right. Thanks. Thank you, brother. Michelle? Yes, Larry. Hi. Okay, hi. The passion that we saw um, and the stuff that happened afterwards, this really has to be dealt with. And No argument. You know, it really has to. And I'd like to thank all the members for their support. You guys were awesome. So. And Brother Larry, knowing you and knowing what you've been through, I know how heartfelt that is as well. So I appreciate you coming up to the mics as well to share your story. Um, I just, and I want to thank everyone for the debate today. We actually got a real true seeing, uh, a first-hand experience of what it's like to be at a convention, to have a say, to be able to share with each other, to be able to not to disagree with each other respectfully and still come out in the end with a solid front on where, how we're going to move forward. And to me, that is the pillar of democracy. And it actually shows how great the MGU actually is. We are the union of choice. We also have special guests. I did mention a couple last night. I'm going to mention again now. Uh, we have uh, solidarity guest, Brother Larry Brown, our national president, president of National Union of Public and General Employees Union. Larry, welcome once again. It's so good to have you with us here today. And I know Larry is going to be here again tomorrow with us. So we have Brother Bert Blunden, the secretary treasurer from Newfoundland Labrador Association of Public and Private Employees, or NAEP. Welcome, Bert. Welcome back. It's wonderful to have you with us. And we have Jerry Taves with us. He is the Executive Liaison of the Health Sciences Association of Alberta. Welcome, Jerry. And welcome to Manitoba. And we have Brother Kevin Rebeck, the President of the Manitoba Federation of Labor, who is not in the room at the moment. He's gone to the other room. OK. Uh, then I'm going to hope that we have Anna Rothesey Rothany here with us today. She's the executive director of the MFL. Anna, are you here in the room? Or is she doing questions as well? All right. But 
welcome anyway they are here. So that brings us to the end of our formal proceedings on day two. Wow, 25 minutes early, something's wrong. Look at this, we are moving right along. Hmm? Someone just said the horrible joke to me and said that, well, we could go into the next set of resolutions, the general resolutions. You really want to get started? <laughs> Letting you know we will have about 10 minutes to be able to do that because then we'll go into the All Candidates Forum. So with that, we have the chair of the General Resolutions Committee and the rest of the committee is where? All righty. Come on up, we will have, uh, I have a sister on mic four while we're waiting for the General Resolutions Committee to come up. Sorry, I'll do my best to hurry because I'm on that committee. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> uh, Diane Arxey, Area 7 Director, uh, Chair of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. I rise on a point of privilege. I'm gonna get through this one. Okay, sister, we're here for you. <laughs> Satori Diop was a longtime active member of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Last fall, Satori's health was failing. She joined us on a five kilometer pride march in Thompson, despite her pain and the fact that she was pushing a walker. By early this year, she got a diagnosis of cancer. By, um, she participated in our meetings by phone and remained dedicated to our work uh, on our issues. In the spring, Satori called me. She was in palliative care facility at the time. She expressed that despite all that she was dealing with, she was fearful we would force her to step down from her position and she wouldn't be able to complete her work and complete her term and come to convention. We welcomed her to stay active as long as she could and suggested, uh, she suggested holding a meeting in her palliative care room, <laughs> which- um, That's Satori. That's Satori, uh, which didn't happen, but um, we were looking at the option of Skype or some way to include her. Time was not on her side and she lost her fight on June 3rd. The committee has in tribute to her final wish to complete her term and come to convention. We have made uh, ribbons with her name uh, to symbolically bring Satori here. These uh, ribbons for all that are interested in, in helping us to complete that are going to be available at the committee expo, the Equality and Human Rights table. Um, I know her family will be at the banquet. Yes. If that's something we could also wear the ribbons that evening, I think that would be wonderful. Um, so I appreciate your support in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sister. We are going to start with emergency resolution six, and I believe it's on the gold papers that were handed out. While you're finding your emergency resolution number six, I'll just briefly introduce the general resolutions committee. Uh, again, Shelley Wiggins, I'm the chair of the committee. We have Stephanie Swain, who is the community-based social services component director. We have Kyle Ross, the Manitoba public insurance component director. David Drew, the health director for the civil service component. And Diane Arxey, who is the area seven director. So we're starting with ER6. The MGU will lobby the provincial government to re reverse its decision to privatize Churchill's only liquor mart and turn it over to a, a private vendor. The committee's recommendation is to accept and it's moved and seconded by the committee. Okay, so it is moved and seconded by committee. Re uh, committee recommendation to accept. Seeing no speakers at the mic. All those in favor of the committee's recommendation to accept, please press one. Those opposed, please press two. <coughs> the 
That is carried. Back to committee. I'm going to do a quick brief. An emergency resolution, folks, is uh, something that has happened since the deadline to get in resolutions uh, in July. So anything that could compromise, hurt our membership, hurt Manitobans, or something that has come up um, that is, is not po a positive for us. So the closure of the liquor store in Churchill absolutely is not positive, not for the employees that work there and not for the town. So this definitely did fall in. The board takes a look at them and uh, decides whether it's you know, an emergency. If it actually falls within that category, then it comes to the convention floor. So just a quick explanation, because I've got I've to gotta respect the brother that said that sometimes being a first time, you don't know everything that's going on. So I definitely appreciate that. All right, Shelley. Okay, and just as explanation to the floor as well, uh, the board had prioritized the emergency resolution, so we are not doing them in the order that they are there, so we will try to make sure we take our time to announce so that you have an opportunity to find them. So the next emergency resolution that we'll be dealing with at this session, and we're not dealing with all of them right now, we're only dealing with a couple and then moving on to general. So the next one is ER1, which would be the first one in your package. <coughs> So ER1, the MGU will lobby the Provincial Government and Addictions Foundation of Manitoba to ensure the youth treatment facility at Compass is reallocated the five positions and resources that were recently cut, and the committee's recommendation is to accept. I so move. It has been moved. And second. And <laughs> Thank you. It's been moved and seconded by committee. Recommendation is to accept. Seeing no speakers at the mics, all those in favor of accepting the committee's recommendation to accept, please press one. Those opposed, please press two. That is carried. Back to committee, please. Okay, now we are moving into your resolutions book, page 62, which is GR1. Okay, so page 62, GR1. The MGU will be supportive of the Red River College facility sorry, Faculty Association's application to the Manitoba Labor Board to create a separate bargaining unit for instructors at Red River College. The committee's recommendation is to refer to the Board of Directors, and with that referral, we are also noting that the Board of Directors is to work with the local executive and, and membership to address these issues. Moved by the committee. Second. It has been moved and, uh, moved and seconded by committee, and I see a speaker on <laughs> mic one. Kimberly Lynn, uh, Local 71, Area 3, Post-Secondary Component Director. I rise in favor of the committee's recommendation. We would like to see this referred to the Board of Directors to be dealt with. Thank you, Sister. Seeing no further speakers at the mics, all those in favor, press 1. All those opposed, press 2. It is carried. Back to committee. Hi. Uh, so this is GR2. Uh, the MGU will change the name of Diagnostic Services Manitoba, DSM, Technical Area 4, Local 390, to Shared Health Local 390. And the committee recommendation is referred to the Board of director Directors with the note, this matter will be resolved after the conclusion of Bill 29 representation votes. I uh, so move. And Been second. Moved. <laughs> moved and seconded by committee. I uh, want a referral to the Board of Directors. Any debate on the referral to the Board? Seeing none, all those in favor of the committee's recommendation to refer to the incoming Board, please press 1. Anyone opposed, please press 2. Lose 
and that is carried. Okay, we're going to do return back to committee for one more. Okay, so this is GR3. Uh, the MGU will continue to have emergency medical services, EMS, and technical professional under separate locals after shared health is formed. The committee recommendation is referred to the Board of Directors with the note to be addressed in the context of all the changes required by the outcome of the bargaining unit restructuring process. I so move. And second. It has been moved and seconded by committee to refer to the incoming board. I'm just watching for, no, no, seeing no speakers at the mics. All those in favor, press one. Those opposed, please press two. That is carried, and I will step down committee with thanks, and we'll see you lots tomorrow. Thank you. All right, so I have an announcement. A Diane Gumprich, please attend the registration desk at 4 p.m. So if you're her, please go, and if you know her, please send her. Um, <clears throat> Before we break to go into the All Candidates Forum, we've got a couple of, of reminders that we've got. The formal convention is going to resume tomorrow morning at 9, and we have many events this evening that I'm hoping people are going to be taking a part of. Uh, uh, from uh, like 4 to four to 5.30, we have our All Candidates Forum here at the Convention Hall. From 5.30 to 9, we have the Honorary Life and Solidarity D Dinner taking place in the Wellington Ballroom for the board and Solidarity Guests and Life members. And from 8 to 9.30, we have the Standing Committee Expo, and that is where all of the committees that work on your behalf through the two years actually have booths set up, and they are able to brag and show you what they have done and what they've accomplished for you over the past two years. So we do ask for folks to come, take some time out of your evening, come and share with them. I believe there might be wine included in this again. And no wine included in this? Okay, Jackie, no wine for you. <laughs> um, so, but it is an awesome, awesome uh, room to be able to go into and you actually get to network and talk to folks and have the solidarity from within each other and be able to talk and find out what's going on around the world around us. Uh, I understand there are door prizes for each and every booth that is set up in there and I've seen a couple of them. Uh, I understand there's some homemade fudge or something, Brother Derek? Uh, uh, some, all right. <laughs> So, we, so I'm hoping to be able to see everybody at the Standing Expo. It's located at the East and the Midway Ballroom at the Fairmont. And finally, from 8 to 11, please stop by the Mix and Mingle event that will also be taking place at the Fairmont. With that, I'm hoping to be able to turn the chair over to a Janet anytime. Just how hard are those questions going to be? Okay. There'll be a little bit of a break, so we don't want people to leave. Yeah. Okay. Well, Michelle's just going to go to the bathroom before the all <laughs> candidates forum. So. Geez, thanks for that, sister. <laughs> yes. I don't want to have a Charlotte episode. <laughs> so bear with us, folks. It's going to take us a few minutes. I know that there is a committee together right now. They're putting together the questions that are going to be asked. And because we have such an active participation in our elections tomorrow, we actually have to move some mics around and get it set up so that you will be able to hear from each of the candidates that are running for whichever position they're running for. So give us five and we'll be back. <laughs>